All right, hello everybody, can you hear me okay? All right, my name is Rebecca Genscher and I am a fourth year medical student, um, as Adam mentioned. I'm at Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School in New Jersey. And today I'm gonna be talking a little bit about transcorneal electrical stimulation, which is a technology that I learned a lot more about uh, while doing about six months of research at Rose Eye Hospital. And I'm just gonna give you a brief overview of the technology and some of its applications. So um, in terms of the history, uh, electrical treatments have been explored sort of throughout the ages. Um, we know that the, uh, there's some uh, evidence to support that the ancient Greeks were using this, uh, these electrical currents to treat diseases as early as um, first century AD and maybe even in BC time. Um, and this is an example here. This is a torpedo fish um, which exerts some amount of electrical current um, which was used to uh, treat patients with headache a uh, long, long time ago. There were also applications of similar types of electrical treatments um, of going in patients with arthritis and pain relief and in improving circulation. So once we sort of got past that initial um, uh, sort of wonder with, oh, there's, there's natural producers of electricity, and we started making our own electricity, we started to replace those sort of natural producers with man-made devices. Um, once we developed static electrical currents and uh, pulsed electrical current that could be applied directly to the skin, the treatments moved along this way as well. And once we got to the early 20th century, sort of an about face, uh, people started to say, oh, this electrotherapy is quack medicine. We have, you know, we have drugs that we can take. We have analgesics that are, you know, up and coming on the market. Why would I take an electrical shock when I could take a pill? Um, and uh, as we uh, continued on in time, uh, some understanding, increased understanding of the neurochemical pathways and the neurochemical compounds and how those relate to different types of electrical stimulation sort of became more apparent and people started to, again, begin to accept these treatments. And we get to the modern day where we have lots of examples of these types of treatments such as transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation which is used for pain relief. Um, we, have, uh, we have deep brain stimulators for Parkinson's, we have cochlear implants, et cetera. So one of these novel types of electrical stimulation uh, used as a, a therapeutic modality is called transcorneal electrical stimulation. And this is pretty new, probably within the last 10, 15 years that this has been sort of tested and developed. So the idea is you're delivering a low voltage signal that goes directly across the cornea into the retina. And you're, you're um, resulting in a, it's a non-invasive way of stimulating the retina directly. So you're sort of bypassing the traditional light activation pathway where light causes a change of those photons into electrical signal. You're instead getting a direct electrical signal to the retina. And um, in some initial studies looking at um, PET scans, uh, what's been found is that there's some activation of some of the sim same types of the brain that are activated in traditional light signaling. And here you can just see this is uh, the, the PET scans during light signal, and this is PET scans during transcorneal electrical stimulation treatment. And you can see some of the same areas in the visual cortex lighting up, and some of these uh, secondary visual areas as well. So what does the device look like? Well, um, it comes in sort of two flavors. And the initial, the initial development was looking more at this contact lens type electrode, sort of modeled after what we use for the electroretinogram. And this is a gold uh, electrode that's applied directly to the cornea. And you can see there's a lot of surface area to cover the cornea, a lot of sort of potential for problems. So um, as time has gone on and we've gotten better technology, we've moved on to more of this uh, silver type electrode which is just a very thin wire that sits right on the lower lid and uh, essentially just grazes the inferior limbus of the cornea, delivering the electrical signal equally as effectively and with a um, uh, much less uh, corneal contact. In terms of poten potential risks of transcorneal electrical stimulation, it's really not too bad. It's very well tolerated. Most complaints are minor. People complain of a little bit of a foreign body sensation. It's kind of like having an eyelash in your eye. Um, and, and some of the potential risks that we really pay attention to are corneal abrasions and corneal argyrosis. These are a little more serious complications that we want to make sure to deal with. Corneal argyrosis, uh, in case you're not familiar, is sort of this brownish, uh, grayish darkening of the cornea and sclera that can happen with repeated exposure to silver particles. And as I mentioned, these electrodes are coated with a silver particle 
that can sometimes uh, be released into the eye. Most of these effects are totally uh, mitigated and even prevented by just um, being really careful to uh, wash out the eye with a buffered saline solution after each treatment. And most protocols include this as a standard operating procedure. So I'm going to talk just very briefly about some of the preclinical work that's been done in, uh, in PES, which has been in the area of retinitis pigmentosa. And just a general overview, retinitis pigmentosa is a degenerative disease. We know that it affects the rods and the cones essentially results in a loss of the outer nuclear layer of the retina, which is the layer of those photoreceptor nuclei. First, you start with some impairment of your night vision and your dark adaptation as you're losing your rods. And then as that progresses, you, can, uh, you get tunnel vision and you ultimately develop central vision loss. And this progression so happens somewhat predictably, predictably over the years. There are some ongoing trials. They've looked at retinal implants. They've looked at different types of gene therapy. Um, but basically, there's no definitive treatment that's FDA approved that's sort of commonly accepted. So this is an area where really better treatments are needed. And something like transcorneal electrical stimulation, which is non-invasive, and as I'm going to show um, pretty soon, seems to target those photoreceptors uh, directly, might be able to be a benefit to patients. So this group uh, out of Japan, Morimoto, they, they uh, sort of got the whole uh, excitement going for this type of treatment. And they looked at the Royal College of Surgeons rat strain, which was a model developed for retinitis pigmentosa. And first, they injured the optic nerves, and they wanted to see what happened to the retinal ganglion cells. And they found that w with applying the transcorneal electrical stimulation, those rat cells, um, the, they survived longer than the patients who had not been treated with transcorneal electrical stimulation. Sorry, the, the rats who had not been treated with transcorneal electrical stimulation. Um, in another set of experiments, which was done a few years later, they looked at um, causing direct damage to the retina. So um, exposing the retina to light, what happens to the photoreceptors? And again, they found that the rats that were treated with transcorneal electrical stimulation, uh, those photoreceptors, although they were injured, survived longer than the ones that had not been exposed to the treatment. And they also delayed the loss of retinal function in these rats. And then in another uh, series of experiments, uh, they considered, uh, you know, sort of, is there anything beyond the direct effects on the optic nerve and on the photoreceptors themselves, sort of going further up into the brain that's going on with this treatment? And what they found is that there was some increase in these regulatory growth factors, these neurotrophic factors, so there may actually be some sort of neuroprotective effect induced by the treatment. So this was all pretty exciting. And um, there were a couple of groups who uh, put together some very small clinical trials. I'm not even sure I would call them clinical trials. But looking at a few, a few patients, um, one study looked at NAION and traumatic optic neuropathy. And they found some improvement in visual acuity. They didn't find any improvement in any of the other measures that they looked at. Another study, uh, in a uh, very small study in three patients, looked at patients with long-standing retinal artery occlusion and found some improvement in their visual acuity as well. So again, although these were underpowered studies, not randomized, it gave us some initial sort of propulsion for getting people interested in this treatment and um, thinking about whether it might be effective for some other types of applications. So this is sort of uh, the, the, the big trial in um, in looking at TES, uh, this is, uh, was done by Schatz et al. in, in 2011. And they looked at a, um, a sham controlled prospective study. So half of the patients got sham treatment, which was just the electrodes replaced, but no treatment was applied. And um, half of the subjects received the TES treatment and 24 patients with retinitis pigmentosa. And what they found was that when you look at, uh, these are four example patients here who had retinitis pigmentosa, when they looked at their baseline visual fields and compared after 16 weeks of treatment, they found some increases in the area on the kinetic visual field. And these increases, or sort of uh, expanding areas here, you can see a little bit, um, didn't really follow a clear pattern, but they definitely found a numerical increase in those areas. And again, this just shows um, increase in visual field area. Numerically, this is the treatment group here. This is the control. This is sort of a low treatment group. Um, you can see uh, that those, uh, those that visual field area was increasing over time. So we're essentially getting back some visual field. 
And then they also looked at the um, scotopic V-wave amplitude and found that that was increasing as well for the patients who had treatment. And essentially what we found is that this treatment was well tolerated. Um, there were improvements in the visual field, again, as we showed uh, with the kinetic area. And um, as I mentioned, the scotopic V-wave amplitude increased. And this just tells you that these patients were better able to adapt in the dark. And so, again, kind of trying to pull back to this hypothesis that um, there may be some effects from the transcorneal electrical stimulation on the retina and on the optic nerve itself, but there may also be some downstream effect on expression of neurotrophic factors. All of these sort of small uh, experiments and clinical trials have been trying to dig at this hypothesis. So just to give you a um, summary of sort of where things are going, there's a lot of uh, clinical trials going on in this area. A lot of these are completed, so it'll be interesting to see their results coming, coming down the pipeline. A um, few of these studies are in retinitis pigmentosa. Um, there's another study here which looked at a whole host of retinal diseases. Um, and then this study is the one that I was sort of peripherally involved in uh, during my time at Wills. And they were actually looking at patients um, who had uh, combat-induced uh, trauma to their eye and also NAION. And then this study down here is actually pretty exciting because they're doing it in the UK. It's um, a multi-center study. It's the first for transcorneal electrical stimulation to really get a good safety profile of the device and understand, you know, if these sort of effects that we saw in these early trials are, are you know, really, really coming through. So I'd just like to acknowledge the uh, group that I worked with at Wills and, um, and thank you for your time. Any questions? Yes, Dr. So, Olson. So this is a fascinating area that's interesting. It is. In Japan, we took off with that because we immediately saw, and there was a lot of clash here. I mean, there was a lot of crazy stuff going on. It's just, they've always been interested in this. And the first time I realized that, I went into a Japanese bathhouse and accidentally got into one of their water coolers saying, you have a pretty powerful stream. And they were all <laughs> shaking and shocked. They said, yeah, we, we use that all the time to do that. Sure. And I'm like, you better be careful because it's going somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there, there the seems to be. The idea is that you'll get, you'll get a little pickup from this in certain areas, but then similar, but that would keep people out of the pool. Yeah, exactly. So like you said, it's a great amount of safety. Yeah. There seems to be some sort of ideal window of treatment, especially for other diseases. There was a, um, another more recent study that I didn't talk about here. Um, where they, they looked at patients with retinal artery occlusion and they actually didn't find much benefit when it was much further downstream from uh, when the initial occlusion was discovered. Um, but some of those early studies found some benefit and the, the difference between the two was the time after the artery occlusion was discovered. So if you treat sooner, you might be able to um, take care of some of those cells that are not functioning but haven't completely died. Whereas if you wait too long, it, your window may be gone and you may not be able to get the treatment. Another hot area was the diffusion mercury in the skin in the retina. Yeah, now and also, they also call that one TES, but it's transcranial. <laughs> because if you're, so um, the, the phosgene level, basically you're, you're testing to see how much current you need to deliver, how much stimulation you need to deliver for the patient to detect a signal to the retina that is as though there were light coming in. And if they're at 150% of that level, then they're going to feel like there's light coming in. Um, so, so far, I mean, my, my experience with the, the patients that were at in the study at Wills is that there, there may be some ability to detect that they're in the 
whichever group. Um, but there's not really a way to avoid that. Um, if somebody can come up with some idea, that would be wonderful. But it's the closest that we could get to a sort of placebo controlled or sham controlled study. Yes, absolutely. And I think that Wilt is getting a lot of DOD. Yeah, so the, the, the traumatic optic neuropathy study is a DOD grant. And actually, we, while I was there, we had applied for another grant um, looking at TBI, which I thought was really interesting. Unfortunately, didn't get funded, but <laughs> um, we'll see. They might keep uh, pursuing it for a while. All right, so our next two presenters, we'll first hear from uh, Nate Lambert, who's a fourth year student here at University of Utah. Nate is originally from Logan, Utah, and attended Utah State, where he studied business.